Hey, welcome to Therapy for Nerds. My name is Casty Russell, and I am here with Abby Ronquillo and Katie Bussey. And today we are talking about conventions. I personally have gone to several conventions starting from the age of around 16 when I went to Anime Expo. Yes, I was that kind of high schooler. <laughs> Back in my day, it was at Long Beach, which was a lot smaller than it is now, or at least it was when it was still, you know, being held. But oh, anyways, so conventions are a great way to interact with fellow people that have a lot of the same interest as you do, whether it be anime or comic books or just anything nerdy. Like uh, I know WonderCon is one of my favorites and it has not just comic books, but it also has a lot of just pop culture stuff I know I saw like a premiere episode of Doctor Who at one of my first WonderCon conventions. And I personally really miss going to conventions. Yeah, uh, like uh, a lot of other in-person things, the pandemic has really impacted the industry of um, conventions. I think as we were talking about earlier, kind of off, uh, off record, it's, it seems like the, the convention world specifically these types of conventions that we're talking about um, that deal with pop culture and, and nerd type things are a really important or an integral part of the so subgroup of people, the society, I don't know what to call them, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, a lot of the interactions just gen generally and in, in most commonly are done online or not face-to-face -face. so i can even recall some of my personal experiences going to conventions when i was much younger that was the only safe place where my parents were like okay well you want to meet an online friend like go meet them at like this type of place or like at a large event where you know nothing potentially could, i mean potentially something could happen to you but my parents didn't think anything could happen to me yeah that's a very common thing of like when you know, my clients would talk about going to conventions. That was a common thing was, yeah, I'm going to go to a convention and I'm going to be able to meet my friend so-and-so for the first time in person. And that, that was a big thing was being able to connect with all these people and having like cosplay groups that you would get together and go with. And there was a large community of people that would make a large portion of their money through selling their their art or something at conventions which has been lost during this time period which is sad and hard to see yeah and i it's interesting because i think a lot of this speaks to the pieces of our lives we didn't really think about and the role that they served and like it sounds like when we talk about conventions we're talking about connections really we're talking about that the opportunity to have a, a common interest and bond together and have the shared experience and then even things that like you know like I, I probably wouldn't have thought about like the idea of this is where a lot of people made their livings like this was a, a really integral part of their their lives and more than just the social connection I mean, I'm sure that was part of it too but I I think there's such a multifaceted piece to these these uh, conventions for, you know, for different people. Yeah, I know a lot of, a lot of the people that made art for conventions also have Etsy accounts. So go support local artists, go on Redbubble and Etsy, guys. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a lot of friends who do conventions for their art and things. And of course, like, when you use any platform like Etsy or Redbubble, there is some type of overhead that you have to, you, you know, you get charged for. And I think a lot of, as a consumer anyways, going to a convention, a big like appeal to it is kind of like that whole, I don't know, is there like a, a term for it, a psychological term of like just being in the moment and being like, yeah, let me buy this, let me do this because you know, this is the experience. Like yeah. I, t I tend to uh, overspend, you know, I tell myself this is the budget, but I ended up all the time overspending on things like that because you just get caught up in the feelings of euphoria, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, there's this like, when, you, when you're in that space, 
you're in this space of like, okay, I am here for a purpose. And sometimes part of that purpose is to spend money. Um, like when I'm at a convention, one of the things that I like to do is look for art or plushies. I'm, I got this little Pokeball at, cause it's a little crocheted keychain Pokeball. I got it at a convention. I don't remember which one, but it, it's just like, I like supporting artists and I like, I was there with the intent of spending money. I would, I would also have a budget. Definitely went over several times, although the food would also like get me because mm -hmm. the food was expensive. I can mention. <laughs> but, and then there's definitely that social aspect. Although I did find myself at some points getting really overwhelmed, especially at some of the bigger conventions. Because I would do a mix of like really small conventions like Long Beach Comic Con or uh, and then I would do big conventions like Anime Expo, which I have since stopped going to because it's just gotten to be way too packed in recent years. Um, but there, it was definitely one of those things where I would have to like step to the side and like do some deep breathing exercises to help ground myself because it was just, there's just too many people. <laughs> Yeah, and um, I think with a lot of those conventions, the nice thing about it is usually there are places where you can kind of uh, desensitize yourself if you need to, even though it is usually very like, oh, in your face, like this, 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 all these things. Um, typically, there would be a place where you could kind of pull away. I know specifically like at Anime Expo, they had like extra rooms or specific types of rooms where you could sit down and watch anime or you can sit and just like sit on the floor, um, which I... I didn't even think of actually now that you're bringing that up is like how overwhelming conventions were yeah like, regardless of how small they were or how big they were they're always very overwhelming and overstimulating and i feel like it was that way before the pandemic and as we're getting back into seeing people in person again like when we get to that point eventually i don't know when that will happen but i I don't see us forever not doing conventions just because it's such an integral part to being a nerd and it's such an integral part to fandoms because I, going back to one of the first fandoms, Star Trek, that was how people in the Star Trek fandom were able to get together and celebrate the thing that they loved was through holding these conventions. And so it's such a conventions is such an integral part to being a nerd that I don't see that going away forever but it's something that I think was very overstimulating to people to begin with and now that people aren't used to being around other people it's going to be extremely overstimulating to a lot of people when it gets to that point where we're allowed to do at least something similar to that again. Yeah, and I, and I, I can imagine there's going to be a degree of like, people may know that everyone's in this together. Like we've all been, you know, pretty isolated compared to our normal lives. But I think there's also a piece of, yeah, it's going to be very overstimulating, like such a sensory overload to be in such a large crowd with so many people and so many things going on. And, you know, I, I almost think that that's something that should be considered is like how, when we get to that point, how do we prepare ourselves for it? Because I can imagine a lot of people are going to get there, they're going to be looking forward to it, and then it's going to be very overwhelming for them. Yeah, I, I, I don't think um, we have really um, absorbed what a year without that type of social interaction could do to a person. Mm -hmm. um, not saying that's gonna be like that forever, but initially that can be a very like overwhelming feeling, especially if you're the type of person who prior to the pandemic, even attending those uh, conventions would get overwhelmed in the moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, you know, as the therapists in the rooms, if either of you have some type of, um, suggestions or ways to kind of self um, self soothe or self or just be more aware of yourself I guess if a person chooses to do start doing these activities again or like reintroduce themselves to to social social abilities and in-person experiences I know like like I said earlier um, I had to step away when I was feeling overwhelmed 
And so, and I did some, some deep breathing exercises and there's a million ways you can do deep breathing. Like for as many therapists, every therapist has their own deep breathing exercise. Mm -hmm. And so the one that I like, and the one that I teach to my clients is very similar to the one that I learned, like taking a yoga class. Um, and that is to use your hand to measure. So you breathe in and your thumb goes up your finger. And then as you breathe out, your finger goes down your thumb. And then you repeat with all of your fingers. And so that's at least, you know, four deep breaths. Mm -hmm. And then you can do that as needed. And so it's grounding because not only is it the deep soothing breaths, but you're also using your other senses, like your sense of touch. And that can help really control and monitor your breaths, uh, which breathing is linked to your heart rate. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, overstimulated, and your heart starts pumping really fast, one of the things you want to do is lower your breathing to help lower your heart rate. Yeah. And I, I think that's such a, a great way of putting it. Cause I, I feel like I love the idea of it being very like tangible. Like you have a physical thing you're able to do. I think there's a piece of mindfulness with that as well. Cause you're like experiencing like your hand moving and the sensations. Um, and, and I could see how for people that would be so wonderful to be able to have that pause and take that moment, recenter, bring their system back to a calm. Um, and, and one thing that I think would also be helpful kind of jumping off of that is like, doing the things that you know you need to do. If it means breathing, it means sitting down, um, you know, what, whatever things that you find calming. But I think the piece that so oftentimes people have a hard time with is noticing when they need it. A lot of times it's like, we're already at like a 10 out of 10 feeling very heightened. And then we're like, oh, I need to calm down. And it's really hard to catch that. So, you know, one thing that I, I think would also be helpful is like kind of knowing, knowing your signs that you're starting to get a little heightened, being able to catch it a little bit ahead of time. So it's not like 10 out of 10, we can't breathe. We're, we're really having a hard time. Maybe we catch it at like a five and we're like, oh, I'm going to try, I'm going to do the breathing now. So I think it's having your coping skills, knowing what you need and knowing when to use them before it's like feeling too late. 